very happy to be with you again today with another talk. So um, it's your turn. Yeah. W welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Um, Hanja's work uh, was, was very hypnotizing, so let's stay hypnotized. And uh, welcome, Francois. Thank you. Uh, so, Francois, you are uh, from Lausanne in Switzerland. Yes, sir. You, you started to your career with uh, graphic design, and then you, you did type uh, in 1989, 98? Yeah, around this I, started to yeah I started to publish that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And you, uh, you have a pretty impressive list of clients, uh, like uh, Apple, uh, the New York uh, Times Magazine, and so on, yeah. and you, amongst many things, you are a teacher in Ecal in Lausanne too. Yeah. You published about uh, type design, and you you wrote about type design, and you published a lot of typeface uh, in the Optimo Foundry. Yeah. And I learned that you are uh, you are a cyclist too. Sometime, but yeah. now I'm. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe is it too much type design? Or we, we don't know. <laughs> it's a nice companion to uh, days on a computer. Yeah. Uh, I was expecting to follow the tour because, okay, there's football, but don't forget the tour. Tour de France, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm a great fan of uh, eccentric Chris Froome. I'm very happy that he is in a game again. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid I will be uh, on my television, in front of my television instead. Of, uh, ah, so sorry how about yeah, that. So, yeah, but so uh, thank you for being here, and please make a warm welcome for François Rappo. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I have the opportunity today to follow up a bit, to, to meet the student from uh, type uh, at Paris and uh, well uh, it was not a surprise uh, it was a bit uh, uh, vertigo to to cover maybe five four hundred uh, cent a century of type design uh, within one day so um, but it's a bit like a dream I still have so I, I have a little trailer first um, I'm, I'm I was trained as a graphic designer so back in the 70s, so I, I'm still very surprised to be able to be, to produce typeface. You know, it's, it was out of my, uh, totally outside of my dream uh, in the 70s. So I released maybe f not even 10% of what I have on my hard disk. Uh, I really uh, like to draw. I consider, I think type design is drawing, and uh, I really like to draw, even if you, well, you, you see outline, you see part of the font. I like to draw. So I'm, when everything is all right, I'm a left-handed. Um, I observe that I have a better understanding of uh, logic and dynamic of typeface when sometimes when I see them reversed uh, to my surprise. Um, I have a dream in, in a home foundry at home because I work in a very small uh, space uh, to yeah, to have like an encyclopedia. So a uh, lot of fonts will, will remain as a sketch, but I like to, to put them on a paper and to be surprised by the result and maybe later on in small circle in a network to say, okay, ah, there's something in that font and I will use it. And, and that the next step is to, to release as a commercial project. And sometimes there's, there's like a gap and a lot of hesitation. Uh, about that, uh, what else? Yeah, it's still a surprise. Um, as a graphic designer, we were trained to make lettering, and for me, there's a huge gap between uh, what I call lettering, uh, typeface for, for a logotype, for a title, things we were supposed to learn in, um, in the 70s. Uh, three books to start with. Um, first one is, um, is a book from a Swiss German photographer, Hans Finsler, at the end of his life, he was a very complex photographer, modernist, but he just proposed his own work with two pinhole uh, pictures. So I, that's what I like in type design. Sometimes we are really uh, 
connected to very basic visual language. There was always a dream I had, uh, being trained, educated in the 60s and 70s. Quite early when I was a child, I, it was a clear idea. I would be a graphic designer. I decided that something somewhere in the 60s, 65, 66. It was very clear. And at the same time, there's another book. Um, this is the original cover of uh, the LSD experience from Aldous Huxley, The Doors of Perception. Uh, working on the typeface, uh, it's uh, refining perception. It's also meeting a reader expertise. So that's what I discovered the, the past five years. So the, the reader is an expert. And I have to understand uh, how he's an expert. It could be part of uh, the brief I'd like to develop. The last book is a bit different. Uh, <laughs> I was a bit shocked when I discovered that in my own town, when I was struggling uh, to try to move from graphic design to, graph uh, to type design, in a high university, you know, the federal university, they had summer academies uh, conducted by two professors. Uh, main professor was Roger Hersch, and the other one is a French professor, Jacques André, and there was, there was a meeting where they're developing algorithms about uh, digital typography, and there was like a gap between uh, this group of experts, this elite of people, and graphic designer like me. And I suspect, but I'm not sure, that at that time, in the end of the 80s, it was top-down culture. The technology was supposed as like a waterfall to, you know, connected to this project, there was industrial type foundry, like Haas type foundry, and the newcomer in, in the field was Bob's type, uh, was, used to be at that time involved in, in type design. They make beautiful projects, uh, like Trinité typeface from Dutch designer Bram de Douge, co collaborated with, um, Business. So there was like something like a gap I had to bridge. It's a bit like a metaphor. It's, you can see the little sign, it's the Wilhelm Haas Weg crossing the Johannes Gut Gutenberg Straße in Basel. You have an organic building, everything seems to be very organic. And this is my idea of Swiss approach, of the Basel approach to type design. It's a former foundry, it's a former house foundry, but today it's a Rudolf Steiner school. And if you go through the picture, it's really a, a Rudolf Steiner organic architecture, the shed. This is a classroom. Uh, the former, maybe here we had uh, punch cutters and uh, engraving machine. The last active uh, punch cutter, Edmund Thiel in Switzerland. And if you go further down, in Basel, you will meet the headquarter, of course, of uh, Goethe and uh, And for me, for my approach, uh, the very precise city when uh, Helvetica was developed at the same city when you has somebody having almost the same name as the head of the house foundry uh, developing the um, LSD um, pharmacology. Uh, trained as a graphic designer uh, in his 70s, the idea was to do everything. Uh, to be an illustrator, I was, I was not a good illustrator. I, was, I had a passion for drawing, but I was hesitating to make illustrations. This is a project we uh, made with friends in the 80s, a cover of the ID Japan magazine, and I also had a, an, an, an interest for colors, for visual grammar, things like that. And there was a time in the 80s, there was so much money in Switzerland. There was almost no time to, to make uh, illustration and design. You, you have to be an art director. You have to have a good phone uh, to commission people, commission your skilled typographer, commission an illustrator, a photographer. And it was part of the gap we had at that time. Uh, then I, I think Everybody has the same feeling. I, I feel I'm a generation in transition. Everybody's in transition. I, I still have a passion for the old industrial typography, type design, but also uh, 
very clearly, I'm, I'm part of this uh, home foundry, private foundry, and uh, through all this year, uh, well, I slowly moved to more serious step design, not by choice, but the feedback we receive from the project we developed. So this is different project, very playful, uh, from the early 90s or mid 90s, scripting, and I, I still have a kind of uh, friendly vision of that approach. Yeah, it's still very fresh. And it was very clearly seen as, uh, how do you call that? It's a kindergarten uh, game. It's a child game from the older generation. Um, as a graphic designer, uh, I had problem with the legacy of modernism. On the one hand, I was very interested in what we call now postmodern, so you can list different value. Uh, 18 years ago, I was commissioned to make, as a graphic designer, um, the designer of a catalog, an exhibition was the, the, the topic was revisiting the 60s. And I was impressed by postmodern statement like uh, visual solution, design solution should be related to a context. It's a bit uh, not honest for, from a designer uh, to repeat, to use the same language for different contexts and different projects. So as I was frustrated by uh, very difficult access to type and type design, uh, in the 80s or previously, for this project, I decided to make a one-shot um, revival. So my idea was to use the font just once and to throw it away. In, in a, uh, so the idea was to revisit um, the Gashner mangled program typeface. It was 80 years ago. Uh, one shot, never use it twice. Uh, as a companion, so this is uh, an attempt to make a rendering of that typeface. And he had companion um, some um, dingbats. Uh, the square dingbats are from one teacher I had uh, in the 70s. And the, the target are from uh, item bands or uh, early optical uh, art. Opt art made by graphic designer. Uh, if I have to go back to the font, I'm surprised that today it's just becoming like a template. So you, I know maybe six or seven digital version of this uh, uh, Gershner program. Later, after I met Christian Mengel, so I, I have a few slides about uh, the meeting, uh, and I'm surprised uh, how it's, it's becoming popular again. Because at that time, you have to remember, there was like a Helvetica bashing. There was a totally new other attitude. And I was, I felt a bit in between. We were shy to have direct contact to this generation, to the senior type designer. But we were also interested to play with uh, part of the powerful design they made. Um, so changing sta uh, taste is an important thing because you have to solve so many design solutions at the end, uh, it's taste. So I also added a bit of uh, lighter dingbats to the, um, to the set at that time for this single use. Then I was also interested in, in the fascination of history. For one project, I make the the full pilgrimage. I wanted to have access to original punches. I would to to touch them. And to it's like a, a bit of mystical things. I did that once, just once. I, I went to. Um, it was in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, it was in Harlem, Enschede Museum. It's a very strange place. The security place. It's like a high security prison. I went there with Peter Bilak and Karel Martens. Uh, and 
then you have access to a seller and you have very friendly people and you have there part of the best French uh, typographic legacy. I mean, the Jules Didot foundry, the remains of that foundry. Uh, at that time, I was a bit anxious because I worked on this Pierre Didot font, and I remember that Jean-Francois was uh, releasing a bit earlier the Ambroise, uh, quite similar. But it was in the first meeting with history, and a, a part of what I do at home is uh, playing with history. So the, um, this first approach to history with no particular method and 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 very clear attitude, so was uh, trying to discover problem and trying to solve them. The font is still um, in, in, in use, it's still commercial today. I'm quite happy to have uh, it uh, in use in Brussels as a part of the communication of the, the opera because during the Belgian Revolution in, in 1830, uh, part of the Jules Didot foundry uh, moved to Brussels and the uh, Netherlands, they was a bit anxious to have a competition from Brussels. They wanted to have them to control the French market. So this is a little story we can add to, to the font. Uh, historical project, it's part of what I'm interested in. There's also a bit of naive uh, rendering of a Baroque typeface. It uh, slept for years on my hard disk until uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, graphic designer Gilles Gavier, I have a lot of collaboration, he's also an uh, uh, initiator of uh, Optimo Foundry, decided to use it. And to my surprise, uh, it works quite well. I must also underline something. As a book designer, I don't like to have, I like to have one single cut, one single weight, if possible. I don't like to have many masters, but this is my attitude as a book designer. So sometimes uh, I have difficult to hear there was just one single master. It works perfectly both for title and text, but later on we had to, to develop the, the family. But as a, as a book designer, I was involved also in, in book design and also uh, in the Swiss competition of best, uh, most beautiful Swiss book for years and I always prefer to have just one single type size, one single weight, uh, the regular one and just one single master, just but following the, the rules of the Neue Typography or the, the Jan Chichol or, or whatever. So, But this typeface had uh, some interest and we I made a version to be part of the Art Fair Basel communication. So. Um, I discovered that art director, they really like to have a digital identity in typefaces. So uh, I underline uh, the digital part, uh, almost provocative of that Swiss Baroque, or it's a Haas, the, the young Haas, Johannes Wilhelm Haas from Nuremberg, working in Basel, did in the 18th century. So it was a bit of a naive approach to history, um, I was a bit, uh, I never used myself the typeface. Uh, it's, it was a bit too weird, but yeah, it proved to be effective on uh, very graphic for uh, the communication of the art Basel. And it's nice to, to tell people, hey, you know, this typeface is uh, connected to uh, the, the history of the city in a way, so. Uh, also, you know, we had, don't forget, we had this years of Helvetica bashing. We have the gap between industry and post-industry. And for years, we had what I call sleeping beauty. Nobody was interested in uh, rediscovering, working with this tradition. In many different countries, you have different um, contexts. In, in some countries, maybe you have quite early digital foundries uh, online on the market, in, uh, uh, but in many places it's interesting to compare what happened between you know, industry and post-industry. And I had the opportunity to follow up the uh, research made by uh, a student and the ECAL on the former uh, Eastern Germany. It was quite similar. It was a totally different political context, 
but the gap between industrial and uh, communist uh, Germany and post-industrial, but like frustration, hesitation, were a bit similar. So I had the opportunity to, uh, I'm not an historian, but to make like a timeline of Swiss type design. And the beginning of the timeline is arts and craft. It's the British private press movement, which I, I like a lot. And, and, you know, it was a trigger that in 1916, the new director of the School of Zurich, they, he wanted to have everything from them, from William Morris. They have the price list, was difficult to find. Uh, he had all the books. He had, uh, for study, for the student, an unbound version of the Chaucer, the masterpiece of Morris and Burne Jones. So th the idea was to make a timeline together with um, the studio norm. They were graphic designer, but doing the, uh, the catalog and the design, but also interest in uh, digging into an archive. And there was a typical sleeping beauty. So nobody made visit to this archive. Beautiful sleeping boxes. And here's, it's from Hermann Eidenbands. One box with all the type design he made for Haas. There's a graphic, the Clarendon, and some other typeface. He made a collage, you know, careful. Uh, you know, it's protected. If you know, in case of fire, you have to uh, priority. And uh, we were reopening those boxes and to make a consistent timeline. This is the working on the, the catalog. And uh, there was a lot of interview. And as, as a graphic designer, a type designer, I was interested to meet uh, still active, talented designer like Christian Mengel from Team 77, designer of Unica. It's a uh, meeting, uh, uh, they were students at that time. Uh, uh, Philippe Carrer is a publisher, and Gillian Cachin, who is a, she's a graphic designer. And you have original uh, drawing on uh, transparent uh, papers for Bob's, uh, this is the media typeface. So I, I was interested to, to make like uh, my own timeline, because you know, modernism sometimes is like a screen. You'd say modernism, modernism, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But the root of modernism, uh, it's not modernism. They, they erased what was behind it. Uh, my favorite style is the arts and crafts, uh, but uh, uh, I tried to connect that to also rediscovery of the Helvetica. So it's still a question. I don't want to go too much in detail. This was the most interesting industrial book produced in Switzerland. Um, there's almost no communication on the art direction. It was the two art director, Eric Nietzsche, one of the most talented uh, art director, both American and Swiss, and Benny Schalcher. They were using original Helvetica. Uh, spot colors, there's three different reds and the black uh, on the beautiful nap cover. And a serif typeface, the, um, uh, what was the, ah, uh, the only serif typeface produced by Haas. I forgot its name right now, sorry. Uh, it would be for later. Maybe somebody knew that, no? Okay. It will come later. Anyway, uh, Helvetica, uh, s trying to redesign the Helvetica for private use. You're, fav you're, f you're familiar with that probably. Um, here again, uh, I have to design it reversed. What maybe it could be interesting to notice, uh, they had different master for Helvetica. This is the master, the most popular one for the light. And uh, to be a bit uh, nasty, I must say what uh, Lanotype did with the new house grotesque is not really uh, correct. Uh, they had two master, it's not very useful, and they miss the opportunity to to make a nice digital version of this uh, original uh, light, bit square Helvetica. Uh, to my surprise, it works very well at both at a large size and small size. So, for many 
similar type phase are designed never to make different masters, to have just the right one, both for display and for text. Um, the, the design of the, the digital version was used for the catalog cover and together with the moon base alpha from uh, Cornel Vindlin was a bit uh, provocative, ironic, uh, uh, DIY-like, uh, early digital typeface uh, in Switzerland. Yeah, and the poster too, was using this typeface. Um, 20 years ago, what could have been the first online foundry in Switzerland? So, um, you know, now it sounds normal to have an online foundry, but for me it was just like, like a joke at that time. Um, as you can see, uh, this is a reconstruction of the early uh, website called Optimo uh, that was online in October 1998. Uh, uh, they were selling uh, font, sound, T-shirt, and had a picture library too. And uh, I will show you some fonts. This is the picture library we had from very nice uh, photograph from Isabel Toniger from Zurich. And we had, well, I don't know if you can call that font. Uh, <laughs> Some font were using the multiple master uh, technology. Uh, yeah, there's our font. Uh, but now it's part of history. So the two websites, Liner2 and Optimo, were the first uh, online uh, foundry, maybe we say. But the attitude, the value, they were totally different. Then we moved to the site as it is right now, we are about to change again, and for me it was totally unexpected. What was unexpected? Uh, to put it very simple, it was um, that it should move, yeah. Yeah, it should move, yeah. To put it very simple, it's the surprise it was to make so much money with font. I was surprised. It totally changed my view uh, and our view. Uh, and here it was also new. Uh, 2000 uh, or 2015 or 2015 was a special year for me because uh, people like a uh, member of Team 77, they're starting to knock on the door to say, okay, we are interested to collaborate with you. And for me, but not for our younger colleagues, it was a total surprise. So how co they decided to work both with Lineato, Lineato, sorry, and Optimo, and it was like a reconciliation, Versöhnung of Deutsch. So, uh, it's like a, yeah, like a dream, the, the grandfather, grandmother, and the, okay, a meeting again. Uh, as you have seen previously, it was very naive. There was postscript forma. It was very poor technology. And now, of course, mastering the technology, it's heavier and heavier. Um, so part of this project was what I call um, a missing link, it was a very successful font. Um, a cash cow, uh, a workhouse, but a cash cow bringing a lot of money. Uh, the idea was, as, as a graphic train in the s 70s, I say, there was always this dream of what could have been the origin of Helvetica, of the different font connected to Helvetica. And in the last interview of the art director of Bertol, uh, Günther Gerhard Lange, um, he, for the first time, he, was, he made very clear that there was something before the Accents Grotesque that came from another foundry. It was a total surprise for me. Um, came from uh, an older foundry called Teinhardt, or the Königliche Gießerei, the royal type foundry. 
um, and uh, possibly other typeface. I started to make some researches. I found uh, this particular font, which is not, I think, connected to the accents grotesque. It's another font called Royal Grotesque. And to my eyes, at that time, it was almost 20 years ago, they were, hey, this is a missing link between the Helvetica uh, and the uh, accents grotesque. So from that, it was probably single cut, single weight, but sorry, not a single cut, hand cut, but a single weight, just a light version. And I extended to a family. Um, I mean, I made different weight, of course. Uh, a bit in the spirit, both of Helvetica and uh, Accents Grotesque. Um, right now, we are still developing the font. We are working on different uh, width. Uh, extended, uh, condensed, uh, and many more. Monospaced, of course. Um, we released a Greek and Cyrillic version uh, this spring. So it was very nice to do it that myself. I, I try to draw everything myself. I don't do the mastering. So the font is really uh, successful. It changed my view on uh, what could be the market and the feedback from the market. The New York Times wanted to have a special version, condensed. Um, the ICA London wanted to have a rounded version. Uh, in fact, it's their logotype uh, still today. And, well, like any quite successful font, it's quite interesting to follow up. It's used by a lot of graphic designer, very, uh, very solid, very consistent corporate identity, uh, almost too, too consistent maybe for me for a university or Nike and fashion designer. So yeah, it's a story of a typeface uh, in the market through the, its different users. So, and you, you don't really learn a lot because I like to work without commission. Uh, but it changed a bit your mind. Uh, you understand a bit uh, the potential of what you, you try to, to develop on in, almost in your kitchen. After uh, dealing with history, I wanted to have uh, a new grotesque, a very slick grotesque. It's not very spectacular. Maybe it's the question now to put on the market a very plain, a very slick font. Some people are expecting to have something striking. Uh, the f it's a slow progress because behind the, its design, it's one of my favorite cover, there's kind of geometry. And um, this is for Wade Guyton. And it's a very neutral, I, mean, I would say very slick typeface. Uh, I wanted to go through this uh, stage uh, to do that, um, to, to learn a bit about uh, that kind of simple, slick uh, design. I love a lot, this is my environment, the, the sans-serif, uh, the, the graphic uh, typeface. Uh, maybe it's over now, it's covered, there's a lot on the market, very good. Nevertheless, I took the risk to make uh, another one based not on type design, on lettering. I, I made a huge difference between a lettering and, and, a, and typography. Typography is really, for me, connected to text, to very dense text information. Other things are lettering, display, something else. Uh, here, for example, it's a course in Germany in the early 30s given by Iden bands, it's for street signage, for huge uh, lettering in, in the street, for neon signs. Uh, and uh, it was a model, and the students are supposed to follow the model, and it was the, the idea for a possible uh, constructed with a few change, a constructed typeface in, in that style, uh, with S maybe inspired by. Jugendstil, I mean, the, the, the German 
uh, arts and craft or early uh, 20th century sensory of Stefan George Schrift or the so it's a short, it's a quick project. I wanted to have that. Uh, it's in use this spring by uh, uh, Zach Kai's studio. Well, it, it's a touch of a bit irrational uh, design in, in this construction. Uh, teaching graphic design, teaching type design, it's still an open question for me. Um, uh, is it possible to propose student like template, like model? Is it interesting or not? Students are supposed to adopt or reject them. Or what could be the balance between individual project and, and template? I was interested to make a generic typeface for and with the student. Uh, to spare time and energy and as a team project because I observe what maybe you did a lot of student a lot of type designer they are more or less like using template developed by the the education they receive they say oh this is coming from the school R or this is coming from the school uh, the H and so on and and why not? But I think it should be explicit for teacher and student to, this is a template, this is a generic model. Um, so we had a team project, short time, like five days, uh, to make a typeface, if possible a complex one, uh, as a generic model. So uh, <laughs> Doing that, I was also interested in this idea, okay, um, if we try to go to the essential, uh, could we meet uh, some parameters that are coming from the reader expertise and experience beyond our idea of designer? So, and I become interested in a parallel field. I, we spoke about that this afternoon with some students about uh, I'm not a specialist, but I was surprised to discover in a parallel field of a neuro something, a neuropsychology, there was very interesting research on uh, reader's expertise. So the reader as an expert, being part of the game, not only the designer uh, with a good tradition, but also the reader. And I'm very pleased to quote here um, famous, very interesting French scientist, Stanislas Dehaan. This is the, the British translation, but for type designer, it's very interesting to, to read this parallel research. It's very well edited. I'm, I'm totally naive about that field. Um, this is, for example, possibly the way the brain is detecting some basic shape to refine its uh, recognition, the reception of uh, basic letter form element. So, well, maybe it's a metaphor for type designer, but it's a good reading anyway. Um, I wanted to imagine the link between, you know, the, if you're a non-expert reader, what do you appreciate, what do you like a bit more this calligraphic element in that type? You don't pay attention to that. Your goal is not to the focus on a type is to, to eat them, to, to grasp the maximum of text information and to move faster. So I came back to this old-fashioned idea, sorry for the metaphor, of eurythmics. Maybe type reading, type design is kind of ergonomy. There's a physical basis common through different uh, writing system, Roman, non-Roman, non-European, they have to meet what the brain is good for. Uh, the starting point was an historical typeface, late French uh, Renaissance, it was Jacques de saint lec It's uh, similar to Grand Jean, so very nice, beautiful, uh, late Renaissance font. And the idea was to, is it possible to make a template of, out of that, both for student and for teacher too, one single curve to be repeated, copy and passed, 
complex curve, of course, to solve most problematic things like sequence of curves. That's always the most problematic things when you do a complex type phase. So we did that. Uh, one version was to have, with a few smoothing, was to have a historical rendering of the font. And I decided to push that project further. This is the historical um, rendering of this Jacques de saint -Lec. And based on the same curves, I wanted to have uh, a font expressing a digital identity. So the curves are m almost the same. It's just the serif and the stroke endings that are clearly like a, like a DN digital DNA uh, for the font. I made also a Italy companion to that. Um, Okay, develop the whole family. Then the font, uh, was a good surprise, was bought by um, Apple last summer to be used in the near future, I don't know how, on possibly all uh, their devices. Uh, and to be like, I was looking for a method and, and, and a logic to revisit historical fonts, and I'm quite comfortable with this final solution here. Uh, it's, for me, it's really different from what I did previously. Uh, well, it's a bit too... Uh, I was happy to see that uh, in the, this year, the competition of the most beautiful Swiss books, there was two books uh, received the prize from Young Studio, uh, from Casper Foloyo here, uh, they were, they seems to be happy to use the font. And this could be a solution for a next project for, for me. Uh, next project, like, uh, here's yeah, a sketch. I'm not sure about that. It's like many type designers, I'm fascinated by William Addison Dwiggins' uh, simple reduction, but without a caricature of a font. So uh, the font is not finished. It will be used in a couple of days by a young studio. I wanted to see if it's possible to meet Twiggins uh, to make a complex font, but without doing a caricature. I don't know if you want, I won't go further. I wanted to have a companion of uh, chancery hand in the style of uh, Jan van Krimpen. Uh, the name of the font right now is Wo, but I don't know what will happen with that style, which is a bit new uh, for me, so. Yeah, it's a bit like a walk through history and through, also would like to have mistake, uh, like noisy uh, detail in the corner. Uh, and so on. Uh, one of the last projects uh, um, was a font for uh, the Giacometti exhibition at the Guggenheim in New York that started uh, last week, I think. Um, wanted to revisit what Herbert Matter did for the Guggenheim to have this very complex 3D-like uh, lettering, um, exploring different solution uh, to be used uh, for the book, for the signage, and uh, maybe later on we will uh, think of uh, developing a lowercase, what uh, uh, Herbert Matter didn't do, uh, to have a companion to, to release the font. Um, a quick view of my last uh, commercial project, uh, will be probably this fall, is uh, Jean Janon. Um, Jean Janon, it's an historical typeface, to put it, uh, I have five minutes. Um, it was the most influential uh, serif typeface of the monotype for the 20th century. It has been uh, revisited by historians, and they were always interested to connect the Janon to Garamond. Uh, there was a local historian of uh, north of France, Jean-Baptiste. 
I forgot his name, but he was a pioneer, uh, Brancourt, sorry, the famous uh, Beatrice Ward, she identified correctly what was named Garamond to Jean Jean, and the last study, uh, very uh, deep, from Hugh Williamson, but I was mostly interested by type designer. He had the original drawing by Fred Gaudi uh, for what was the Garamond monotype, uh, which is true rendering of Janon. And I think to make a good uh, revival, we have to learn from previous revival. I always like a lot um, the uh, Tony Stan ITC Garamond, especially because he very correctly push the Janon toward a more calligraphic solution, which is probably not correct, but I really like that. And to put it very short, I propose to connect the Janon to a Flemish uh, design, map design, information design, and not to France, sorry, and not to Garamond, uh, to Yodokus Ontu, so the hound, it's a signature, quality control under the control of his dog. It, don't just make devices like the, the tool of the... And the Janot, to put it very short, has to be like cut it in steel, um, to be dynamic, sharp, of course. And I wanted to simplify it. It's more obvious here. Uh, to a very simple vector, but I wanted to have a bit of noise to increase the dynamics. So the counters is tilted, and nothing is really upright in it. And to find like a, a digital language to to translate the yeah the genre. the full set of swashes. It's, it's like a journey in a in a foreign country, yeah, uh, so, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. So, does anybody have a question? No? I, I have a question for you. So we saw at the beginning of your presentation you you spoke about your early work and you did some really expressive or uh, uh, typeface or alphabets um, and then you you did s more rational rational things. Do you think uh, with the new you you used uh, multiple master technologies uh, at the time? Do you think with the new variable font technology you will mil maybe come back again to some explorations or some more graphic uh, alphabets or things like that? Uh, I'm curious because, you know, uh, I, I, I have some doubts about interpolation. Why? Because I'm, I'm still, I know you can have any possible step between different master. But I, I don't know, it's part of my old training. I, I'm a bit scared of having generic-like weight. I mean, it's pos I like to have weight and, and, uh, or different cuts that have a very specific identity. So when I, s I, I look what that has been done for, uh, I think it's Adobe, I don't like that. So it's like a pizza, you know. Uh, you can have a generic pizza. It looks like a pizza. I don't know what we'll have tonight, but uh, <laughs> but sometime you have a, a real pizza. So yeah. and, and no, I, I, I'm just maybe I'm, I'm because I'm not a, ner a technology nerd. So I'd like to draw. I like to have. It's, it's difficult to achieve different way to having a, a true identity. I know on the paper it's possible. I use interpolation, but I'm, I, w I probably won't be the first one to, to, to dive in, into that, uh, that technology. So uh, I, I like to, have me to work with a single weight, you know, that's okay, I'm open. I, maybe 
that's why I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with a small network of, uh, in a foundry, there was people, hey, hey, you have to do something else, and they pushed me to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. Maybe so, someone? In the 60s, there was a, a big battle. I will not say fight, it's a little too much. Uh, there was a sans serif guy on the serif guy. Or yeah. the sans serif guy, no, the serif guy say, okay, with your sans serif, it's ineligible for text or whatever. It's not possible to design such typeface at all. If you came with universe with 21 series to everything, to cover everything, it's not possible. And now you are designing serif as some serif typeface. What do you think in, in, with the distance of this kind of battle of, of the time? Why they, 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 they argue against each other at the time? From well, there's these different things. You know, you maybe also noticed that I don't do super family. Uh, I'm not comfortable with this idea of having, for example, uh, a sans serif companion of a serif and, and, and to have like super family. I, I'm not familiar with that. I'd still like to combine different types. Uh, well, you know, it's a bit like what happened in Switzerland, you know, uh, part of the, there's like two, two niches, they used to have two tribes, two, two community within this, the wider community of typography or type. There was the book designer and there was the advertising or communication designer. And in, in book design, it's very clear. In Switzerland, we had specialists of book design. It's today, we have Jost Ochuli, we had uh, the uh, older Jan Chihold, we had uh, uh, Max Kaflisch. We, they, they was they were beautiful books for just to read. And there were young graphic designers like Gersh now. They were, it was like young art director. There was very clearly two culture. And there was sometimes no bridge. We also in Switzerland between them. There were, you know, remember the, the discussion between Max Bill and Tichel after the Second World War. But it was not about aesthetics for me. It was about two different fields. It was the book design versus advertising, maybe. And um, I don't know, it echoes from what happened in France, uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the need were covered by monotype product, like everywhere, till very late. And uh, House Foundry had only niches product for like advertising again, Helvetica Clarendon was not designed as a book, as a text typeface of so just uh, advertising and signage. And nowadays, for, for your generation, for, for the younger generation, uh, you're beyond that. And uh, this notion of super family, or it's um, blurring totally the two schools. Uh, I experienced that in, the, in a Swiss book competition, because I started uh, in the late 90s to be part of the jury. And there was clearly like two traditions. Uh, you know, the expert of ligature, of micro details, and uh, graphic designer, so. And this was blurred by the, the new technology, so. But I remember the, the advertising, uh, introducing the syntax typeface by Stempel. They say, hey, uh, serif uh, nerd, hey, send serif nerd, here's the bridge between your two communities. Maybe that's that. Maybe a l last question? No. Oh, yeah. So, hello. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not studying typography, nothing. I'm studying civil engineering and architecture. So I, I see that you are, you are always saying that, like there is a relation between science and architecture and typogra typography. And uh, how do you get this inspiration from architecture? Like how ty typography get inspired by architecture or maybe it's, um, maybe architecture ins get inspired by typography, I don't know. 
So this is my question. Well, it's always a bit dangerous to make a parallel, but we, you need to do that when you're the most pro difficult problems to understand curves for me. For example, you can imagine to have an ideal typeface based on a circle, like you can have some uh, architecture based on rational uh, volume. Uh, but as soon as you wanted to produce that, you have to go beyond your ideal notion. Uh, when you spend so much time on curves, that is, you have a set of elements at, at hand. And yes, you, you for example, uh, I used to sometimes to, to classify uh, this shape, for example, here is based on an optical experience. But this other shape could be based on a haptic, on hand based experience. It's more, you feel something. Here it's more only for your eyes only. It's like an architecture. You want to, to I don't know, to have something more organic or more optical. I don't know. It's things like that. And also in proportion. In well, it's a bit of a challenge to make a honest parallel through history. But some historian did that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but maybe it could be just for yeah, to work your workplace, to, yeah. to have a better notion of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, so, thank you for the presentation as well. It was really good. I'm really inspired by this sort of style. Uh, so, uh, you've seen, a, I guess, two, three generations of graphic designers go, well, you've grown with them. Uh, but uh, my question is, like you know when they say for the guitars, for example, they haven't invented a better guitar since the 60s. So I'm just wondering, like, what do you think of the graphic design today and maybe in the 70s when you were studying, right? Like what's the new, what do you think of it? Is it, is it, is it getting better? Is it not getting better? Is it getting more interesting? There's a lot of things going on those days and maybe for typography as well because like essentially uh, Jean-Francois is always saying that it used to take one year to make a font. Today, it still takes one year. And, you know, like it's. Uh Thank you. Well, this is very yeah. That's two. Two possible answer. On the one hand, uh, graphic design is more popular than ever. There's more people involved in graphic design. Though this is totally new. Uh, to, for example, when I. Uh, uh, wanted to study, uh, we were in my class six students in the 70s. And it was in many Swiss schools, average uh, student, there was like less than 10 in a, in a classroom. And now if you go in many schools, there's 20 and more. And if you were in some countries, that's 100 and more. There's more and more people involved in communication. There's, more, uh, there's a wider market, uh, but there's more competition, and maybe also uh, some designer have less time to, to be on the market, but maybe it's good too. Um, on the other hand, I'm extremely surprised by the change of taste. So uh, last five to 10 years, a whole generation moved back to modernism. There was totally unexpected for me. So it's like a template uh, running from studio and studio. So I want to have geometric backgrounds, so, uh, the direct uh, element, minimal colors or basic colors. I wanted to have a linear typeface or not to speak about uh, corporate design. Everybody wanted to have a, a geometric typeface from Google to Samsung to MasterCard to... so. It's, it's quite fascinating, so I, it's difficult to make a picture of that. Is it like a, you know, a plug-in niches, like uh, archigram architecture of the 70s? You have niches and niches and, and the dynamic and the three or four dimension. Um, so I'm, you have bad, bad side, but it's very positive in a way because I think it's dynamic. But what is, it's impressive. Everybody wanted to have a grandfather or grandmother being a modernist today. I don't know tomorrow, but today. 
you know, if you go through a young graphic designer website, they all share the same language. So, uh, for me, type design is a bit over now. So it was like a new territory in the 90s because it was neglected by, it was a bit lost in the, in the gap. If I have time, I would uh, go back to visual grammar, abstraction, colors, and why not illustration, but <coughs> for me, because it's covered, so I will still, I'll continue doing type design, but it's a bit like a routine t for me today. But part of the graphic design culture is also picture, all kind of picture, maybe it's a digital 3D, it's a maybe motion graphics, I don't know, colors, study, a new aesthetic, there's new colors on screen, uh, analogical. A new uh, understanding of how we perceive colors. And it's quite similar to type design. It's a bit forgotten, I think. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Francois. Thank, thank you, everyone. <laughs>